Element Rescue will be presenting a two-part podcast on the application of evidence-based medicine within tactical combat casualty care guidelines and the subsequent product recommendation. It's entitled The Good, The Bad, The Irrelevant. It's definitely going to get some individuals' feathers ruffled, but what we ask is that you keep your emotions at bay, listen to what's being discussed and presented, and of course, please research it yourself afterwards. No one can argue the incredible amount of good that the TC3 guidelines have brought to the military and specifically to point of wounding combat care since its emergence in 1996. I was absolutely blessed in that I had many good friends that have been on and are currently members of the TC3 committee. We've been fortunate enough to rely on these relationships through the years while instructing tactical combat casualty care, beginning with our first class in 2003. We've done hundreds of these classes within the civilian community until the emergence of TECC, or Tactical Emergency Casualty Care, in 2011. For quite a few years, many of us thought we understood the premise of evidence-based medicine and put faith not only into the Tactical Combat Casualty Care guidelines, but also their recommended equipment as it is listed by vendor name in their guidelines due to the fact the committee's foundation was solidly backed by evidence. After a series of conversations with friends in US SOCOM, uh, questions from many civilian tactical organizations and consecutive friction points that occurred in training with tactical combat casualty care recommended equipment, which we discussed within this podcast, we had to ask the question, really, what the heck is evidence-based medicine? How is it that it seems there's very little operational thought that has actually been put into the approval of the recommended equipment? And what is the medical definition of evidence? Is it not really as the name applies? To further add complexity to the situation, after a 2014 review prompted by the Secretary of Defense, as of four months ago, all military health systems in which some of those TC3 exist now have to become high reliability organizations or HROs. As you'll hear throughout this podcast, evidence-based medicine is solidly founded within a normal distribution curve, while HROs live inside a power distribution curve. The HRO model recognizes not only the outlier, but also your environment and how this shapes your response and capabilities, while the evidence-based medicine guidelines recognize neither. Those critical variables are not present in their research, which is actually at the core of their guidelines. We will provide papers, research, and links on our website to help you navigate through your own organization's research on this topic. Please feel free to email us with any questions, concerns, or comments. Thanks. We are once again here with David Van Stralen, doctor, West Coast, former paramedic, then became, what do you got, man? Pediatric internist and HRO. Intensivist. Yes, intensivist. Intensivist. Do a bunch of stuff, obviously, with HRO. We did that three-part series on HRO with you. And what we're going to talk about and start to talk about this evening is evidence-based medicine. So just as a really quick background, I've got a – I just popped open a little bottle of uh, Newcastle. I've got a coffee, Adderall, and some dip, man. So I think we're we're good to go on this thing here for at least a little bit. So there's some guidelines out there, one specific guideline that's based for combat that many of us have followed, a lot of people still following – that is evidence-based medicine, and for a lot of years, probably from 2002, 2003 is when I first started getting into really teaching it and learning about TC3 and, and evidence-based guidelines. And a lot of times what, what I found is that was our argument is by its name alone, you really can't argue with evidence-based medicine. How can you? It's evidence. And I think everybody gets this in their head, and for pretty much most of a decade, if not more – I threw evidence-based medicine out there all the time without really knowing what it was. I assumed I knew what it was. And it really wasn't until we were talking, a group of us were talking not too, too long ago, probably about three, four months ago, and we started bringing up some potentially, for lack of a better word, epic failures that have occurred within within the, the the life of that and it went from you know the preferred antibiotic years ago when our military was was heavy into Iraq. And the, the preferred antibiotic by name and these, the evidence-based guidelines, people were deploying and could not use it because that antibiotic would not constitute in heat, which, which seemed kind of interesting. So there was a scramble to, to figure out what antibiotic are, are you going to use in those hot temperatures. And then there was a wound stat ordeal where uh, hemostatic came out years ago, and it was, it was presented as if it was a gift from God. Everybody was getting it. It was the number one hemostatic on these guidelines, and literally within a few months, it was destroy it, 
it came from Satan. Uh, it causes emboluses. If you have them, if you're deployed, if you're if you're conus, take them, burn them, destroy them. Make sure no one can get their hands on it. Uh, then there was the the Hexten deal. Uh, there was uh, where all the the data was actually fraudulent, and the guy was getting paid on the side. Although Hexen didn't have a negative, it did not have the capabilities that that was presented. There's you know most currently, which probably brought brought me to the point of investigating this even was the fact that all three junctional tourniquets that are recommended in this guideline, the evidence-based guideline, have failed in excess of 95% on every rescue training that we've done. And I found that really appalling. So if I'm putting somebody out a window, if I'm moving somebody in a confined space or structural collapse, I have multiple times broken, like catastrophically broken every single junctional tourniquet that they've had on there. And I just started questioning, how can that happen in an evidence-based guideline like that? Because it's, it's evidence, right, Dave? So when I started pulling up all these studies, I started realizing, and this is kind of what, what brought you and I talking about this, is I could not find one study, and we're going over a decade, so it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies that have been sent out by the guideline committee, and I could not find one study that ever involved the operational environment. And that was astonishing to me. The environment where all the hemostatics, all the tourniquets, the junctional tourniquets, you name it, was studied was was actually in a lab with fluorescent lights. And as I'm flipping through this, I read the first part of the study and throw it to the side. It's irrelevant, man. You know, it doesn't have anything about rescue. It doesn't have anything about this. Look at it, this one doesn't either. This one doesn't either. This one doesn't either and realize that that's really problematic. So we have kit that's being recommended in an evidence-based guideline that has not been evaluated in the environment of its use, which brought you and I talking together. And what you brought up to me was the fact that that evidence and evidence-based medicine as a whole, along with all those studies that I was looking at, lives in a realm of a normal distribution curve and we never work in that curve. Your thoughts, Dave? Well, I want to start off by uh, evidence-based medicine has its place and its role, but it's like on a hot, dry day, I've been working hard, I might want a carbonated soft drink with ice, very, very cold. On the other hand, if I've been out in uh, 10 degree weather for two days and I'm still out there someone gives me a iced drink depending on my clothing I might find that a little uh, difficult to drink because it's too cold Um, and and we forget the environment the role the environment plays in this majority of people doing research are going to do it in a lab their equipment is there they're they're there and their assistants are there Um, and it's an easy place to drive to there are people who do field research um, so don't get me wrong. Uh, we're not going to you know, put everybody down. So <clears throat> you have to control for the environment. We don't want to see the influence of the environment on our study. Unfortunately, that's where we use it. Uh, I might have an antibiotic that's wonderful given every six hours, but if I were to give that to a working parent to give to their child, uh, the child's going to miss some because the parents at work or the kids at school, and it's more difficult we have to remember not only the physical environment, the social environment we're in. And so evidence-based medicine has some limitations for the environment very clearly, especially those of us who do not work where the research was done. The second aspect of evidence-based medicine is that, um, and Fisher did this, and Pearson got involved in the 20s. They both were slightly different points. But the question is whether you're proving that your population or your sample is similar to another sample or the population in general. So they take a normal distribution, which things tend to have in the natural order of, of the world, and they compare how close their uh, their means are, their averages, that center, that highest peak. And they do a number of manipulations over the years to find out how to correct for different changes. The data has to be random and it has to be independent. Uh, random is that I can't choose the numbers I want, and independent means that if A happens and influences B, I've got to decide which comes first and which should I measure. measure. So normal distributions are well-known, random, independent, and they're good statistics when 
a research study and you control one variable. Okay, real, real quick on there, which brings to a point that I, I didn't bring up and because you brought up random and independent, when I first started looking into evidence-based medicine uh, and research and even talked to somebody at the center of evidence-based medicine out of the UK, the epistemology was brought up over and over and over again that the, the evidence is based on a scale of epistemology and the higher that level, the better that or more pure that data is, the more strength it has. And at the highest level was your meta-analysis of random control trials. So that, and I think that's why that fits into that curve so well with what you're just saying, correct? Yes, a random uh, trial, the, 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 I want to come back to what epistemology means. It doesn't mean you're angry. Um, <laughs> epistemology is an is important concept in this ranking. Epistemology is, some people will tell you it's the science of knowledge or the study of, of knowledge. But uh, I like more useful terms. It's giving value to your belief. In religion, there are people who give value to certain aspects of their um, sensations or beliefs or experiences as communications with um, another world or spirituality. Um, other people have the same feelings from uh, being a part of a larger group or a larger program or a, a movement. Those feelings are very real to them, and they put such value on them, it becomes knowledge. And that's important because when you're working in the streets, you'll work with guys who, and gals who have a, a very strong faith in something working. That's because it's a belief. They put value on that. Researchers will put value on a belief of measurements, and that becomes knowledge for them. So knowledge is... is uh, something we va uh, we value our belief so strongly we call it knowledge and we're certain about it. So I have this way of doing research. There's qualitative where I look for the qualities that are present and, and I do that with interviews. Some people say we can't do research on love and well you can when you start dividing love up into different qualities of love um, how we love maybe uh, food versus our, our spouse versus our mistress versus our child and parent, all different types of love. So we define those and we interview people to find out if they have those similar qualities. So that's a qualitative difference. Quantitative is I measure it. Keeping in mind now there's a problem with that because if I was to ask you, are, are you tall? I, I Well, it, it depends on who I'm comparing you to. And when if you're standing up in a kindergarten class, and, I, and yes, you're tall if you're an adult, um, whereas if you're in a bunch of basketball players, you might not be. So tall is what am I comparing it to? Then I have to divide up tall. So if I have a, a group of, of a thousand people and I ask people who are tall, I might want the top 10%, the top 2%. I might want one standard deviation. All of that I have to define what the word tall is and I divide it. Unfortunately, every time I divide it, there's one person who's half an inch away from being tall versus medium versus short. Um, we have to categorize. When we start categorizing, we can lose information because the world is a full spectrum. And, and, and not only is it a full spectrum of height, it's also a process. So if I ask you what's the average height of people in the city of Los Angeles, you might give me all the adults who have finished growing and leave out the children and infants and adolescents because those are processes. And we, we discount processes. We, we make it easier that way to, to discuss. So... We in the field of emergency services, we see things start small and develop larger and, and snowball. They get that cascading failure effect and entrainment of more energy and more problems. And more people show up at the scene, which makes it more difficult to work. We now have traffic accidents caused because of this. That's a process. And we, we see events as a process. That's difficult now to measure because not only am I doing a spectrum of time equals zero, and I'm adding time to it. So we're getting into some complexity. But let's go back to uh, the epistemology of evidence-based medicine. So I've got categories. I mean, I've got, uh, I have uh, qualitative and I've got quantitative. And now I want to, how can I control it? And the better I can control the conditions, the more accurate the experiment is considered. And the more valid it is if it's measuring what I say it, it measures. And it's reliable if I keep measuring it over and over, I get the same numbers and the same results on the experiment. Keeping in mind that a lot of medical research, when it's reproduced later, may be found not to have the same conclusions. And that was a study done in 2005 that was published, it, a lot of people refer to. So 
what's the, the gold standard of research? It's if you can take everything randomized, you control everything but one event, and you do it prospectively going forward in the future. What a beauty that is of a research project. And that's our, our control study. The larger the number in our study, the more precise it can be. We want to be sensitive and we want to be specific. Sensitive that picks up um, the, the, the most nuanced piece and specific is it only picks up what we want and nothing else. Statisticians will tell you something different, but that's, that, that'll work for us. So that's a randomized controlled perspective study gold standard. Now we have ones where they don't have quite the control. There may be a case control where uh, people are treated before the treatment, after treatment. There's a lot of different ones and those are ranked. And those are ranked now so we have a, a large group of research on a topic. We layer them based on how good the research is in our epistemology, how we value the knowledge it created and added to the system. Some add more uh, knowledge, add more value those are your randomized control of prospective studies. And some have less value because I took a 1,000 people and I went out and measured who has this and who doesn't. Just a population study, of incidence of something or the prevalence. How often does it show up and how often has people had it? So, so that's the epistemology they talk about in, in evidence-based medicine. Now, given that description of giving value to our different ways of doing the research, let's leave the research lab for a minute. Let's go out in the street and... The research says that uh, if you say A, you can expect B most of the time, 80% of the time. So you're in the field, you see A, so can you really expect B 80% of the time? Well, sure you could. How does that help you? Because what if 80% of the time is good and 20% of the time is bad? So I see this thing and I know that 80% of the time I don't have to worry, but 20% of the time I do. What do I do about that? Well, I got to treat it as if it was 100% of the time it was bad. That's the problem with some of those research things that are not 100%. Because at some point, you might decide that it's, it's important anyway. Most of us would agree that 20% chance of a bad thing happening is significant for us. But what about 5%? What about 1%? I was talking today about a behavior found in somebody on the, on the scene for an EMS call. And a lot of people I'm talking to were just saying, well, you know, that's the way this person is. That's the way people are. And it wasn't until I got tired of hearing that that I pointed out the exact same behavior was on a previous incident I investigated, which led to a death of a person because everybody was discounting the person was really sick because they always get called out. And the death happened shortly after these guys all treated the patient and transported them and delayed care. And, and so if it happens one out of a hundred times, for me, that's serious and I don't want to see it again. But they're going to look at, and this is the danger, they're going to look at those 99 times it didn't happen, and they're going to be able to reinforce that they're okay. So in this incident, and I hope I'm not confusing people because I don't want to give away protected information, but in this incident I said, if this patient didn't die in the field, then the people on that scene are going to justify that what they did was right. It'll actually make it stronger that they're doing the right thing. They, and they'll, they've stopped looking, and even though they're emergency responders, and some are public safety, they're looking at it as, as confirmation bias. They want to confirm their bias towards confirming that they were right. They're going to look for information that shows they were right. So by not treating, they're going to say we're okay. Why? Because I can only come up with one case over the last 10 years where someone died from it, directly from that behavior. They're going to come up with 99 cases they've had where nobody died. And now you can see what happens with our evidence-based approach. If it's 1% of the time or half a percent of the time, People still have to put value on whether that's useful or not. My experience, those who work in live or die situations where they have seen somebody they know died or somebody died under their care, which they felt was preventable, the percentages don't even count. Uh, I like what Admiral Mercer told me once. He says, I don't want to have that happen again. And so as a result, if you think it might happen, if you think it's possible that it'll happen, you work to prevent it. Whereas the evidence-based p- uh, approach is, the probability is so low we can disregard it. Right. It's such an outlier that it's no big deal. It's so random. It's so independent. It probably won't happen again. Don't worry about it. Those are the two problems. I've, I've gotten away with bad care or bad uh, behaviors and actions because nothing happened the last 99 times, so I don't have to change. And number two, if I do see an outlier, I disregard it because it's so far out in the standard deviation, I probably won't see it again in my lifetime. I like the 99. I got 99 problems. Medicine isn't one. That's a Jay-Z song. 
a little bit younger than you, so uh, I thought I'd throw that in there. But you brought up a good point, and I wanted to hit on that that we really didn't hit on. I also interrupted you when you were talking about the uh, normal distribution curve before is that, you know, random and independent. It falls within this curve. There's certain deviations. And in that, that is really where the the term outlier came from is it it lies outside the normal bell curve. And in systems that are based on a normal bell curve, that outlier – is typically seen as an anomaly and swept away as uh, as such a rare occurrence that we really don't even have to think about it. Where with the other system that we're going to talk about with the power distribution curve, where it's now considered something you do need to think about. So where normal distribution curves go into probability, and anybody that wants to pull up hundreds of the studies that that you receive a few times a month with the evidence-based guidelines that a lot of us uh, keep track of, you'll see on every one of those studies a p-value and automatically be able to tell that, that that entire study was done within that normal distribution curve. And in that, I think right where I was started to interrupt you is you were talking about you can only have one variable in that normal distribution curve. And for our purposes, a lot of times with looking off these evidence-based guidelines, that one variable is obviously going to be the products that they're looking at, whether that's a tourniquet, a hemostatic, a junctional tourniquet, whatever. There's your variable, but the variable that really by definition you cannot change is the environment. And the environment, I would, I would say, is what shapes real-world operations constantly. That is an ever-present issue is that environment and the interaction and working within that environment yet on normal distribution which is evidence-based medicine that that can never be a variable in there that's why we don't have studies that hey let's take a look at this in a rescue situation let's look at look at this in with sand and blood inside the Velcro of the tourniquet that you're utilizing. Let's look that into the plastic windlass uh, tourniquet after, you know, we know it has micro fractures and whatnot in it. It's hydrophilic, so it accepts water. Let's do it in this environment and see how it breaks. We We don't have those studies. We never see those studies yet. That's the operational reality. And if you could go into also, I think, which is really interesting, is really everything that we deal with, our injuries and things like that, are not our, our, our normal physiological state, and then especially our body under insult of injury, it's always multiplicative. It's never additive. And the normal distribution curve are linear additive qualities where power distribution, which you'll need to discuss and explain also, deals with the environment. And it is multiplicative because as you create complexity, which would be adding the environment and adding these other realities of real world operations into it, Things become complex, and off complexity becomes bifurcations, and you are in a very nonlinear system at that point. So can we really translate guidelines and studies from a Gaussian curve into a world that we operate day-to-day, which is not that world whatsoever? So I'll leave you at that and have at it. Yeah, well, let's um, look at environment for a minute. I, I was on a state committee in California that was writing uniform treatment protocols for paramedics, and... We got to nitroglycerin for myocardial infarction, you know, heart attack, chest pain. And, and the argument discussion was, do we give it to somebody with a systolic blood pressure of 100 or 90? And there was some good discussion going on, people making the case. And I, and I was listening to it, being a pediatrician. I, I didn't have a dog in that race. But I did notice that even though the people were interspersed around the table, I, I knew where they came from geographically. And the people in Southern California wanted a, diastolic, a systolic blood pressure of 100. The people in Northern California wanted 90. And I finally inter- interjected that idea. And I said, the Southern Californians want a higher systolic blood pressure because they work in a drier, hotter environment. And people are more likely to be hypovolemic. And if you have 90, you'll uncover that hypovolemia with the nitroglycerin when you vasodilate. And they hadn't thought in those terms because the environment even affects your blood volume. I'm out in a desert area, and it's not uncommon for somebody, say, to uh, be working in the yard on, on humidity of 10%, and uh, they work hard, they, they don't drink enough, and they're dehydrated. We may have a motor vehicle collision with somebody with, uh, you could predict how much volume loss for the stage of, of shock they're in, but you'd be miscalculating because they went into it with maybe uh, one to one and a half liters of, of uh, blood volume lost because they were so dehydrated and they vasoconstricted to maintain a core circulation 
and function while they worked in the yard. You, you work in a geriatric community, and you might find men and women for various reasons um, anatomically are, are dehydrating themselves so they, they don't wet themselves. They don't have urinary problems. And when you get them in it as a patient, medical or surgical, uh, you may find that they're hypovolemic and dehydrated. This is the environment. So the environment has a number of effects on it, of, of, of your disease states. But let's look at the environment as, as culture. If I tell you what somebody ate for lunch, there's a good chance you can tell me uh, where they live. And if I tell you where they live, you can give a chance to tell me what they're eating. Obviously, somebody in the central desert region doesn't have a lot of seafood. Um, and I'm always cautious when I'm in the desert area <laughs> and ordering the seafood. So the, the one definition or description of culture is it's the social response to the environment, which is important to us because our environment in a pre-hospital emergency setting is austere, it's isolated, it's hazardous. So a lot of our thinking and performance, our behaviors, our beliefs, even our epistemology come from this. And then you throw in you know, the time constraint. It, it makes a different science Whereas uh, a physician doing uh, medical research and using medical research well is generally going to be in a well-controlled hospital environment where you don't have the changes in, in temperature, humidity, and even rain. Does it, it, short of a broken pipe, it should not rain inside of a hospital. So we have our culture is, is separated from it. Our patients are influenced by the environment. And, um, and our environment changes See, and, and how we respond to it. Some people drink more than others. Um, with water, I'm talking about. We live in a, in a very dry area, so I noticed the kids in the baseball teams that we were playing near the end of the game were getting sick, and, and they were making stupid mistakes, really stupid mistakes, like standing still while somebody walked up and tagged them out. That was one of the better players. So knowing that it was probably dehydration, I had all of our kids in our, on, on our team drink water before we played. And uh, we might not have done well at the beginning of the game, but we started pouncing them at the last half because our guys are hydrated. So, so that's culture, is response to the environment, our patients' response to the environment. Now, in, in looking what this means, um, let's take Pittsburgh. Uh, if you look at Pittsburgh in 1600, 1700, it's not much reason for it to be there. It wasn't much there. But when we start looking at water, uh, bringing in coal, bringing in iron, you could make the case that the friction of transportation of these things of the coal, the iron, and the steel is lowest at the confluence of those rivers to create Pittsburgh. The environment created that city and made it huge. It grew from a small city to a large city. There's our time portion again that it interferes with our ability to do a normal distribution. And then as uh, things changed, uh, coal, iron, steel, um, iron ore, that all changes, transportation changes, cost of friction changes. Pittsburgh is no longer quite the, the size. The reason it's big is, is not the same. Well, what does that mean? If you look at all the cities in the world, you're going to find a few that are very, very huge and a lot are small. I could not have predicted who was going to be huge back, say, when uh, the Dutch bought New York. Who would know it would be so big? All big cities, the hugest, largest cities had to start from us. A big city, which came from a small city, which came from a tiny village. And... How do we do that? When, so what happened was Pareto was actually looking at wealth, not income, but wealth, how much people owned. And he found that there was no normal distribution. You do not have an average. You do not have as many rich people as you did poor people. He found that it actually made a different kind of curve. And this curve was weird in that, uh, well, that's the 2080 curve we have. 20% of, of your um, income, say, comes from, or most of your income comes from 20% of your, your, your clients. Anytime you see 2080, you're talking about this kind of a distribution. It's not the normal distribution. It's a it's called an inverse power distribution, ZIPF, Z-I-P-F law, the Pareto, a Paretic distribution, logarithmic distribution. It, it, it shows the effect, as you were saying, Sean, that whereas a normal distribution, you add the probabilities, you add the statistics together. In the power distribution, they're multiplied. So we can see that in... Um, when they were looking at can you predict uh, mortality rate from injuries in the late uh, 70s, mid-70s, early 70s, actually. And they found that they, they were adding up the uh, injury organs. They were adding up sy systems, and it wasn't doing well. When they squared the numbers, the values, and then added them up, they got a nice prediction, a linear prediction. 
what they did is they created basically a, uh, a power distribution, the inverse power curve. And that's the injury severity score, right? The ISS that, score that's the that most people are, yep. Right. That's why, um, and, 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 and I don't know the numbers, I'm not that's that specialist, but I asked an orthopedic surgeon once. He was talking with a, a kid with several long bones and he was concerned about the kid's survival. But I thought, well, I thought a long bone could heal. And, and, and any of you who knows the science, forgive me, but basically, as I recall it, he says, well, if you have one long bone fracture, that you, the chance of you dying is very slow, low, a broken femur. Two long bone fractures, you now you have a 50% mortality rate. A broken femur, which is completely survivable. A broken uh, humerus, completely survivable. Two of those, you can end up with 50% mortality rate. Three, you're up towards 70 80%. Four, you're close to 90%. Basically, he was describing, and I listened to him, he was describing a curve because you simply didn't add the numbers. They increased, they multiplied, mortality rate multiplied, and that's the power distribution. So we're seeing these interactions. Uh, people who are over 65, if they fall over from a height, they're standing still and they fall over, have a higher, much higher chance of dying than a 30-year-old, uh, uh, significantly higher. So what we're seeing now is, is that Two completely independent things interact with each other in a way that makes it have new properties and it's unpredictable. Think of having a, a couple of great people at a party and you don't realize that um, when they drink, they both act differently. So they're perfectly normal people. You work with them. They show up. One becomes uh, very outrageous, funny, and he's the life of the party, just clowning around, becoming intrusive, bugging people. They didn't want to get away from him. The other guy becomes angry and belligerent and bellicose and fighting. And all you did was add the same amount of alcohol to people that you thought were really nice. And that nonlinear interaction between their personalities and the alcohol and the party and then each other. And you've seen that sometimes with two people you you love dearly, and then you put them together, and they don't get along. That's all nonlinear. Yeah, and I, I usually I usually start taking my clothes off. But we were talking the other day, and, and this is kind of interesting: is a lot of things that were once thought to be captured within the Gaussian curve or that normal distribution curve aren't. They're actually, and I think you were bringing this up, is if we, when we look at that, there's a time factor to that, and there's a distance. And if we look at a short enough s- segment of it, it may look linear. But as we look at it holistically, it actually has a curve to it. And I think that was the case that uh, Bruce West brought up. And we were just recently talking about that. And he, he wrote a book and he has a great PowerPoint called A Medical Tale of Tales. And I know you, you've got the book and, and I've got the PowerPoint. The book you got the book. I do. You sent it to me because I, I didn't buy it because it's like 85 bucks, man. Uh, but Bruce West, who is actually the mathematical and information science uh, director at the Army Research Office. And the guy is one like every – known military science research award known to man but he's a, he's a specialist in, in really I guess uh, what you call fractal phenomena and how it implies with inverse power laws and in this he basically went on to show that pretty much your entire body is based in the way that it reacts whether it's the injury or even to a certain extent homeostasis from cerebral blood flow to you name it is not Gaussi and it's it's actual power distribution curve and in that paper it basically says we are really probably looking at how we do medicine the wrong way and the research that's going into it probably is not that accurate and that actually falls in line with the 2005 study that you were just discussing that you sent to me also titled why most published research findings are false and talks about the the natural bias that actually goes into that, the prejudice that can be going into that. And when he looked at these large scale studies, uh, he found that when there was a specific outcome that was being looked for, that those studies gradually just became biased and everything fall in line to technically make them false. Yeah, the, uh, the nonlinear uh, is interesting when you check someone's heartbeat. And that was the uh, lecture I went to at uh, – the Society of Critical Care Medicine Conference um, in the early 90s, they talked about nonlinearity in heart rate. And if your heartbeats are exactly the same distance between each other, precisely, it turns out in the ICU you have a higher chance of dying. And when they're nonlinear, which means there's a slight variation between um, the beats, the P to P, the T to T, however you want to measure it, R to R, then there's increased survival. And, and the uh, a view is that when they become linear, you've lost a lot of function 
and things are becoming predictable. But think about this. You don't have these interactions that you had before. If I'm riding a bicycle, how many movements do I make to stay balanced? That depends upon the road I'm on, the speed, other activities, turns, and even the wind. Now, if I were to limit myself to only two or three and make them additive, I actually lose my stability. The more I can have these things interact proportionally, you know, a little bit of some and a little bit of, uh, less of another, and I can change that ability, that, that amount I'm adding, then I become uh, you know, more stable. So it turns out that linearity is actually a marker for instability. And nonlinearity is a marker for stability. So you think about that when you look at, at requisite variety, which is a term, I forgot who brought it up, but it's, it's a nice term. Requisite variety is if I have an emergency, and we found this out in discussing uh, disaster planning for our county. So I was happening to be at the table for all the nursing home administrators for the, the drill. I knew that in San Bernardino County, when they did an evacuation, the reason they bring nursing home people out last is because they had once, the only death was the nursing home death when they transferred the patients. So I brought that up to the people here, all these administrators. And it turned out that um, every one of them had a story where they had to move the nursing home because they were doing some construction, their building. They had some reason to move a large number of patients. And every one of them had stories of patients being hospitalized at the ICU or even dying during the move. Because uh, when you get into the... Uh, the elderly group, 80, 90 years old, or you start having some dementia, they don't do change well. And you have a physiologic response to the body. You don't have the ability for the cortical surface of the brain to temper it, to modulate it. And that physiologic response becomes deadly. It's kind of like the cycling of pain from a heart attack. When I was working in the field, you could look at someone's face, you knew they were going to die, and they died en route to the hospital. We started giving them morphine, and they didn't die. And, and we know the data is we went from a 50% mortality rate of MIs before they got to the hospital to almost 0% just with morphine. Why? It broke that cycle. See, So I'm at this table, and as we're giving our announcements of going around the room of how we want to prepare for a major disaster, fire, we have to evacuate large cities. I asked the people to bring up the deaths that occur when you evacuate a nursing home. And nobody in the room even knew that. Even the table, they hadn't realized it was so common. And that's requisite variety. You want to bring all these points of view in. Now, the problem with that is it makes a more unstable program, it sounds like. In reality, it's more stable. Why is it more stable? Because now I have so much information coming in, I can process this, and now I can be reactive, I can be agile. So it's only unstable if you're not processing the information, if you're not using this dirty, imperfect information. And oh my gosh, what do people, when they respond in the field, they're experts at this. The people who work in an environment of time constraints, of austerity and isolation and threat and hazards, and, you know, when they work in that environment, they learn, and this is the epistemology, they learn to give value on certain things of certain beliefs that work. They may not be able to put words on them, but they put value on that. And they work and they're successful and they don't die. So that's what we're looking at is, is how do you use this messed up information to become more stable? And oddly enough, it works. But it's made to work because the people in the field think and behave differently than those who work in a hospital. No, that's, that's interesting. And, and going on the same line, there, there's two main things I want to hit on. The first, which kind of falls in line with what you're talking about, is, is the complexity that naturally exists when we have somebody that's injured. So just like the femur example that you gave is when we put these rules or, or these guidelines that, that's based in this, this normal distribution curve and we find that, wow, we don't ever actually even work in that environment, and we find that physiology is not in that environment either, you gave an example of the three – ways that people die are the three things that will kill you or your patient in a pre-hospital setting. I remember it was uh, uncontrolled energy, the uncontrolled behavior, the uncontrolled physiology. And each of those kind of shows the complexity one way or another that we always will be under. Uh, can you go through that real quick and kind of describe that? Well, yeah, the, the, if you look at how people die, you could look at it as, as uncontrolled energy. And that's going to be – I use five forms. It's going to be a mechanical or kinetic energy, some physical force, uh, electrical energy, thermal energy, chemical energy, 
and then the nuclear ionizing energy. Those are your main ones. And, and why do those uh, um, cause problems? Because we know from, and I don't want to get into thermodynamics, but in uh, nice clear terms, two laws of thermodynamics are critical to us. Energy can transform and energy dissipates and spreads out. That's all the needs physics we need for right now. It can change forms in that we know that electrical energy, say from a lightning strike, hits the skin and can cause burns, muscle damage. And kinetic energy can turn into friction and cause heat. So we know that, that if we're trying to develop a system that keeps energy from transforming, it will find a way to transform. Then if you look at energy dissipating, we have to contain it, which takes energy. So I could have a large uh, gas mass inside of a, of a closed space, and if I make the vessel strong enough, yes, I can contain that gas. But when we look at those little canisters of, of propane fuel we use in our camp stoves, why do they not recycle them? Because when they go into a recycling thing to be melted, that small bit of gas in there explodes and causes it to break down. That's one of our issues. Even morbidly, if somebody's too large, they have a hard time with them with crematorium because of the heat produced from all the excess fat that the uh, retort, the, the, the container for it is difficult to use. So as much as we think we can contain energy, it's very difficult. That's why it kills people and that's why it can be unpredictable. Uncontrolled behavior can be basically the bad guys trying to hurt us. And what we want to do with them is use intimidation and project our command presence. On the other hand, behavior within the team can kill the patient. And I talked earlier about that <clears throat> with guys who were on scene intimidating each other, uh, intimidating families. And within our own system, we have behaviors that can kill people. So, so that's what we're looking at. And then uncontrolled physiology that you're not going to deliver oxygen to the tissues. Well, where does it come from? It comes from the environment. So we lose the airway. We don't breathe. We lose all the oxygenation capacity. And then it's got to be swirled around in the body through the cardiac output. So that's how we died that way. And I came across this when I was reevaluating my life on the field. And an example of that would be a guy who was trapped in a car on a lawn. There was a gas leak. So we're worried about, well, you know, the catch is on fire. We've got to get the guy out. So you would normally call off an engine company, truck company, have water just in case there's a problem and cut the car apart and get them out. But something had happened and everybody's angry with this guy and they wanted to beat him up and they were, they were hitting him. He couldn't escape because he had a broken femur and he was trapped in the car. So what is going to kill this patient? Bleed to death with people hitting him on the thigh where his legs are going to be breaking apart. The fact he's in a dangerous situation with the car. So we have physiology, we have uncontrolled behaviors and we have the possibility of uncontrolled uh, thermal release of heat, fire. So my partner and I then had what's going to kill him. So we said, we got to get this guy out of here. So we lay him on, we pulled him out, rather unceremoniously, the two of us, put him on our gurney, laid over him with our bodies so they hit us instead, and put him in the back of the ambulance. So they drove off. We have a guy who's hitting me, standing, holding onto my door my ambulance, beating me in the head. My point is, is that when I look back at the call like that, there's no outside force, service, or anybody who's going to help you. Because by the time you call for help, it's three to five minutes for anybody to get on scene, either fire or cops. You can't get to the radio to get it to work to even call and talk to a physician. You're the only one who can make that decision, and you have to make it quickly on what's going to kill the patient. Trapped in the car, trapped him around people who are hostile and want to hurt him, or his physiology is, is, is uh, damaged. And, and that's where the, the judgment, the decision-making, the problem-solving – and the epistemology, giving value to your belief of what's true. What was true on that scene? And go to a person who's never been in that situation and ask them what they would do. And look at stuff they get out of the movies and television or what they read somewhere or wishful thinking. You see, and, and that does, none of that works. That's, that's their epistemology. Our epistemology was we had to do something and had to work immediately. And we had to know clearly that it did not work immediately. We couldn't wait to see if anything would work. It had to be done immediately. And that's the way we think. That's the way we problem solved, and that's how I took care of the call. I don't know if I would change it even years later, thinking about that call. I don't think I'd ever change the way I did it. That's what I want to share with the people out in the field. Don't feel that uh, you're missing something. If you, if you uh, look back at what you did and understand the principles behind it and identify the scientific principles that support you, that's your epistemology. How do you identify that there's a science behind what you're doing that makes it right? And if there's no science supporting it, you have to question it. 
you have to ask, is this the right thing? Or is this something that's been going on, passed down for years, and we believe it's right because we want it to be right? So you do have to question everything you do, just like scientists do. You have to be self-correcting, just like scientists do. But the difference is the epistemology for scientists is the randomized controlled prospective study, and for you it's, did it work immediately? All right, that was the end of part one. Check back soon for part two and the conclusion of evidence-based medicine and tactical combat casualty care.